He has appeared 15 times on the cover of Time magazine. His life and his ideas have given rise to characters in films and novels. He was at the center of power in Washington four decades ago, and yet at the age of 93, Henry Kissinger remains an authority as a geopolitical thinker and advisor, while at the same time continuing to be a target of severe criticism for his past policies as Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. Neil Ferguson has just published the first volume of an authorized two-volume biography on Dr. K. It's called Kissinger, 1923 to 1968, The Idealist. And we're delighted to welcome Neil Ferguson back to TVO. So good to see you again. Good to be here, Steve. Okay, I must confess when I heard two volumes, I thought a thousand pages on the White House years, plus what came after, I get that. But this book is everything up until the White House. And I must confess, a thousand pages before you get to the White House? Did you wonder whether or not there was that much there to deal with before he got to the White House? Well, there definitely is. It's the first half of his life, and, and it seems to me that you, you get this wrong if you only talk about the years in government. You can't possibly understand the man. Uh, after all, this is a man who was a refugee from Nazi Germany, a soldier in an American uniform, a Nazi hunter, uh, and then an academic uh, for 20 years before he was invited by uh, Richard Nixon to be national security advisor. So this book covers the first half of his life. It's an extraordinary life, and I think it fundamentally changes the way we think about the man. At least that's the intention of the book. And just so we understand, authorized biography or in cooperation with or did he have any veto power over what you did how did you work all that out no veto power and it's very good that you asked that question i'm always a bit wary of authorized biographies because i suppose one assumes that the subject is sitting there with the manuscript deleting the sentences he doesn't like in this case i had access uh, to kissinger's private papers uh, but i said to him uh, at the outset i'll only do this if I have a completely free hand in what I write. I, I'd actually said the same to the Rothschild family years ago when I undertook to write a history of the Rothschild Bank. I said, I will strive to write the truth as it actually was. I'll try to build that story from the archives, but you won't like it all. And you, you've got to be aware of the fact that there will be things in the book that you will not be comfortable with. Uh, and there are things in the book that he's not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But I had a completely free hand, and I think that's, that's important to emphasize. Nobody wants to read a hagiography. Uh, uh, that, that's not the kind of book I write. But I think you did say th there were maybe a half a dozen sort of personal family references to things that you did allow him to take out. Uh, fewer than that. I think, I think there that. were three quotes from letters that related to his first marriage. And we had agreed at the outset that quotes from personal letters of, of a family nature uh, we'd have some discussion about. I thought that was fair. Having been through a divorce during the writing of this book, I completely understand why you wouldn't want every line of your correspondence uh, uh, about your first marriage in print. But that was the only, that was the only caveat that, that we had. And the rest of the book, as I said, is, is completely unedited, uncensored, whatever you want to call it. I know you are taking a lot of flack for the subtitle, so of course I'm going to ask you about the subtitle, because there are lots of people who don't think that Henry Kissinger is much of an idealist. The book on nuclear weapons, the supposed involvement in the coup in Chile, the ultimate realpolitik chess player is not a guy you think of as being an idealist. So why'd you pick that subtitle? Well, of course, uh, you might think it was just me being provocative and contrarian. But actually, it's based on my reading of the many documents in his private papers and in other archives on which this book is based. I thought I was going to write the first volume with a subtitle like American Machiavelli. That was my working title when I set to work. But once I began to read through the material, I was struck by the fact that he was anything but a realist. In fact, that caricature of Kissinger as not just a, the arch-realist, but Dr. Evil, a caricature that my countryman Christopher Hitchens did much to create, certainly falls apart in this first half of his life, because on at least three counts, he's far more an idealist. I mean, number one, uh, his experience in the 1930s and 1940s certainly made him wary of foreign policy realism in that sense, because for him, the appeasers who had appeased the dictators in the 1930s had been failed realists. He, he said uh, in a memorable interview in 1957, the appeasers thought of themselves as tough realists. That was not intended as a compliment. Mm. And then there's this philosophical side to Kissinger that's so important. At Harvard, he immersed himself in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant and, and idealism as a school of 
philosophy. And finally, and I think this is a really key part of the argument, for Kissinger, the Cold War was not just a struggle between economic systems. It was a struggle between totalitarianism and the idea of freedom. So I show that in the first half of his life, uh, he really was the idealist. The second volume will have unquestionably have a different subtitle. Let's focus for a second here on Southeast Asia, which of course was a huge part of his professional life, what to do about Vietnam. President Kennedy, one of the people he advised, funnily enough, supported the coup in South Vietnam. Kissinger was critical of that and wrote that the honor and the moral standing of the United States require that a relationship exists between ends and means. Our historical role has been to identify ourselves with the ideals and deepest hopes of mankind. Again, getting back to your subtitle, yeah. those are not the words we expect to hear from Henry Kissinger. How is that the same guy who was so, okay, use the subtitle you didn't pick, Machiavellian mm. later in life? In a way, I can only answer that question in volume two, because it's clear from quotations like that and many others in this book uh, that the man who advised Kennedy uh, was in many ways more idealistic than Kennedy. Uh, that's not the only occasion when Kissinger criticized the Kennedy administration uh, to which he had at least for a time belonged. He criticized Kennedy over the deal on Berlin that led to the Berlin Wall. He criticized, criticized Kennedy over the Cuban Missile Crisis, the way that was resolved. So again and again on a whole succession of issues in the early 1960s, Kissinger tends to be on, let's call it the idealistic side, complaining about the deals that Kennedy was prepared to strike. Uh, with the Soviets, and particularly complaining about the coup against Diem in 1963, which was, uh, in many ways, one of the most shocking acts uh, of American foreign policy in the Cold War. So the book, in a sense, poses a question. Uh, it's a kind of cliffhanger. Uh, what exactly changed uh, after 1968 uh, to lead so many people to associate Kissinger with an absolutely ruthless, amoral, uh, realpolitik? And I think that only the beginnings of an answer are in this volume. Uh, and I've deliberately saved the big answer for the second volume. So I've got to wait three more years to find that out. You do, Steve. I'm really sorry. Uh, don't hold your breath. I'll give you a clue, though. It has a huge amount to do with Richard Nixon. Uh, and as I show in this book, Kissinger had spent a lot of his time avoiding Richard Nixon, criticizing him publicly throughout the 1960s and, and even earlier. It was Nelson Rockefeller that uh, Henry Kissinger wanted to see as a Republican president, not Richard Nixon. And when Nixon offered him the job in 1968, Kissinger was so surprised he didn't realize he was being offered the job of National Security Advisor. He had to be offered it twice uh, in a second meeting. Did he have quote unquote politics because how, did, how I mean JFK is a Democrat, Rocky is a, a very liberal Republican, Nixon is a far more conservative Republican and there's Henry Kissinger advising them all. Did he have politics? I think he saw himself as a kind of non-partisan expert on international relations and he made a point of talking to candidates as it were on both sides of the partisan divide uh, having advised Rockefeller uh, he then ends up in the Kennedy administration. Uh, and then later on, he ends up not only talking to Richard Nixon in 1968, but also, also talking to people in Hubert Humphrey's camp. Now, you could say this is a sign of his lack of principle, but I don't think that's right. I think Kissinger was, in his own mind, a European conservative. Uh, that's a different thing from a Republican. When he came up into close contact with Republicans at the 1964 Republican National Convention in San Francisco and saw the supporters of Barry Goldwater, Kissinger was absolutely appalled and they didn't much like him. So I think one of the things that's interesting about Kissinger is that in a sense he doesn't happily fit in to either the Republican or the Democratic Party. Uh, and that's one reason why he ends up with enemies on both sides of the political spectrum. The left, of course, criticized him vigorously throughout the early 1970s and afterwards. But we forget that the right did too, and that some of the harshest critics uh, of detente in the 1970s were actually the future neoconservatives, people on the right uh, of the ideological spectrum. Aren't you a little bit sad that Christopher Hitchens is dead and not around to look at this and carve you a new one? More, more than a little bit. Mm. Uh, Hitchens, although it must be said his book, The Trial of Henry Kissinger, is not a profoundly researched work, uh, was Which nevertheless a gifted yeah. polemicist. I think yeah. he consulted about a dozen documents in all. Although he was um, no historian, Hitchens was a great journalist and a great debater, and I was fond of him. 
And I think in many ways it would have been wonderful if he'd lived to uh, review this book. I remember thinking about it when I agreed to take the project on, which is now 12 years ago. And I remember thinking, boy, will I get a hell of a review from Hitch <laughs> if I do this? And it wasn't to be. And I'm sad about that. I think Hitch was almost enough of a contrarian to give it a good review just to annoy <laughs> his friends on the left, as he'd annoyed them over the Iraq war already. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, all right, I take you uh, for the points you just said about why those on the left and the right had a problem with him. But you do posit another theory in the book as to why people may have had a particular problem with Henry Kissinger, and that is he's Jewish. Right. Can you go into that a bit? Why would, well, I mean, it's an uncomfortable subject to get into, but put your theory out there. Well, I, I thought a lot about this as I was reading through some of the more uh, vicious attacks on him that have been published. And believe me, they get worse than Hitchens's. And I started to feel I'd come across this sort of stuff before, this almost poisonous, acrimonious criticism. And I realized that I was, I was reminded of things I had read that had been written about the Rothschilds in the 19th century. And it's a rather similar critique that exaggerates the power of the subject and, and also endows them with a kind of evil, uh, malicious purpose. Uh, and I do think that if you look at American secretaries of state since the end of World War II, it's not as if there's something unique about the things that the Kissinger, uh, that Kissinger did. Uh, we already talked about uh, Kennedy's involvement in the overthrow of a government uh, in South Vietnam. But, I mean, regime change was routine in the 1950s. The Eisenhower administration did it in Guatemala, and for Iran. example, and in Iran. And so one question that comes up is why are there no books uh, listing the war crimes of, I don't know, John Foster Dulles or, or, or Dean Rusk? Uh, and why is it that a special standard appears to be reserved for Kissinger? Now, you could say it's because uh, he was in Nixon's administration, and, and Nixon as the most discredited president of modern times uh, taints everybody around him. But I don't think that's quite convincing. I don't think that's quite enough. I think in many ways Henry Kissinger became a lightning rod for the resentments of a, a generation, call them the generation of 1968, partly because uh, of his Jewish origins and his foreign origins. Uh, and I think that's the only way to explain this viciousness of the criticism. Now, this is not to say that Henry Kissinger did no wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, the point I'm trying or to make... people are anti-Semites if they... Right. Disagree it's with It's possible them. to criticise yeah. Henry Kissinger for other reasons and to have other motives. Some of his critics are themselves Jews. But I think it's impossible when you look at all that has been written about him uh, and the somewhat hysterical tone of at least some of it, it's impossible to completely rule out the fact that his Jewishness has made him a lightning rod. Let's go back. Let's go back more than 90 years. The first new thing I learned about Henry Kissinger in your book is that his name actually wasn't Henry. What was he born? Heinz Kissinger. And was what his was name. his family life like back in Germany where he was born? He was born in a little German town called Furt next to Nuremberg, sort of industrial manufacturing town, not, not very pretty. Uh, and he, he grew up in a relatively orthodox uh, community. His father was a school teacher, respectable. Uh, profession, teaching at the girls' secondary school in, in Furt. Uh, and I think Heinz Kissinger had led a relatively ordinary uh, life as a boy until, before he even turned 10, uh, the Nazis came to power. And from that moment on, he found his rights, like the rights of all other German Jews, being whittled away, including the right to go and watch soccer, which was his great passion as a, as a boy. He loved soccer, and of course there will be a... Soccer, of course, a great uh, strategic tactician's game. There will be the temptation to say, ah, of course, his early foreign policy brilliance was forged by watching those soccer games. He has made jokes about this, yeah. but they are jokes. It, it, OK, so you're not going that far. I certainly not. I think one of the things that's important about the early years, and this is something that Kissinger himself has said, is that one can't read too much into those early experiences because as a kid you're not hugely aware of, of politics, much less of foreign policy. I think the formative years for Kissinger came later. Actually, they came when he returned to Germany just six years after he'd left as a refugee as a GI, uh, as an American soldier. And that return to Germany was, I think, formative. Formative because he saw war at first hand, and formative also because he saw the Holocaust at, at first hand. Being present at the liberation of a concentration camp must have been an absolutely searing experience 
uh, for a, a German Jew as, as he had been. Uh, and I think that, that is one of the critical moments in the early part of this book, the moment when Kissinger writes down his responses to witnessing uh, a concentration camp. Uh, when did he do liberated. that? This is 1945. No, no, when did he write down those? Oh, shortly afterwards. It's not clear exactly when because there's no date on the document, but okay. it wasn't long afterwards. The, the reason I ask is for, for a guy who's born in Germany, who was a Jew, who saw the rise of the Nazis, who managed, thankfully, obviously, for him and his family to avoid it, he, he seems not to have been... He didn't write a lot about the about the Holocaust and about what that meant to his life. And I mean, have I, have I misinferred that? Well, I mean, he wrote this extraordinary uh, two-page reflection entitled The Eternal Jew, addressed to a 16-year-old inmate of the concentration huh. camp, but he didn't publish it. Okay. And I think that there are two things at work here, and I try to explain them in the book. One is that Kissinger lost his religious faith during the war. It's not exactly clear when. And he grew up in an Orthodox home, yeah. right? Yeah, and there was a rift in the family, uh, though not, not a, a, a permanent one. Uh, but there was a, a moment of, of ghastly truth when he and his brother returned from World War II and explained to their devout, uh, devoutly Orthodox father, "We." we we don't believe anymore. Uh, and I think that created a certain reluctance on Kissinger's part to talk about those issues. It, it was such a sensitive uh, point for the family. Uh, th the other point that's important, though, is that he did not write much about the Middle East uh, in, his, in his early career. In fact, you'll notice that there are only very occasional references to the region in, in the voluminous published work. Uh, of his early career, and almost no references to Israel. Though he did visit Israel at some point, I think in 1967, he didn't write about it. And that reticence, I think, is possibly related to the religious issue, or it may simply be that Kissinger focused on Europe, studied European history, and to a degree detached himself from questions that would loom very large in the Nixon administration. Uh, it's, it's remarkable to think that a man who played such a crucial role in the Middle East, especially in 1973 as the, the peace broker, uh, had really written almost nothing about it and, and really can't be said to have studied it in his academic career. But the expression I think you use in the book was that he has a complicated view of democracy uh, because he's, quote, a child of Weimar. What is that supposed to mean? Well, that's something that somebody else Somebody else wrote, said that, and you quote And it. I yeah. disagree with that. I think this... One reason that Kissinger has pulled back from discussing that part of his life, I think, is that people have written a lot of psychobabble about it. That ah, child of Weimar. I mean, what does this mean? I mean, as I said, he was nine uh, when Hitler came to power. It's not as if he had diagnosed the ailments of the Weimar Republic uh, before his 10th birthday. I think the more formative experiences come later, and I don't think there's any question about his commitment to democracy. On the contrary, he stays in Germany much longer than he had to right into the summer of 1947, as he says, in a letter home to his parents to make sure that the sacrifice of his comrades who had died in the war was not in vain and to make sure that Germany this time was going to be permanently democratized. I want to play a clip. I had the pleasure of interviewing myself 11 years ago and we'll play a little excerpt of that interview and then come back and chat. If you would please, Sheldon. The French have exploited it somewhat cynically. The Germans have exploited it somewhat romantically. Somewhat? Um, Romantically, in Romantically. the sense that Germans are looking, the French have essentially the strategy they pursued at the time of Richelieu 300 years ago against the Habsburgs. That is, we are the superpower and they're trying to cut away our preeminence and they're using any crisis to give themselves a greater margin of maneuver. The Germans are in a new, new situation. They have a third of their country which feels itself occupied rather than liberated, and that hasn't had the same experience of post-war reconstruction. It is, in the, for the first time in 50 years, in a position to define a political identity that is not tied to the Cold War. So all of this has led to a sort of abstract pacifism in which people who used to say 50 years ago they were the best warriors, now they're the best pacifists, but they're always number one in the class. 
Do you ever ask him about that voice? That voice is absolutely unique and unmistakable, isn't it? It, it, it went from tenor when he was uh, a young academic down to baritone, uh, and ultimately it's bullfrog now. <laughs> and, and, and that's his phrase, not mine. The other thing that you notice in that clip uh, is the humor because it ends with a, a good joke at the expense of the Germans. Now they're the best pacifists, they used to be the best warriors. But they always want, but to, be they number always one. want to be number one. It's a, it's a classic example of something I talk about in the book, that Henry Kissinger's rather mordant sense of humor has sometimes got him into trouble. Uh, a style of humor that I associate with the wartime generation, actually associated with Groucho Marx, was very unfashionable by 1968. One of the striking features of the, the 68ers, the student revolutionaries who became so ferocious as critics, uh, of the Nixon administration was their almost total lack of a sense of humor mm -hmm. and there's a tendency in some of the Kissinger literature to take his jokes out of context and print them as if uh, they're for real. Tell so one of them. A good example of yeah. this is, is the line in which he says uh, the illegal we do immediately, the unconstitutional takes longer. Now this has been quoted time and again uh, by his critics, but it's obviously a joke if you see it in its context. It's an ice-breaking joke at a meeting, in fact, with some Turkish diplomats. Uh, but one could go on, there are others. Power is the ultimate aphrodisiac, I think, has to be the most famous of all Henry Kissinger's lines. But again, if you go back to see uh, it in its original context, it's a joke. It's a self-deprecating joke, it's essentially saying the only reason that I can get starlets to have dinner with me is that I'm Secretary of State. Uh, and I, I think there's a sense in which there's a, there's a Kissinger style which has to do with a rather mordant sense of humor uh, that for some people just greats. Mm -hmm. uh, the reaction if you're an earnest reader of Christopher Hitchens is, how can you possibly make a joke about German history? Uh, and I think it's partly because if you've gone through the experiences of his early life, a you know, refugee drafted into the US Army, pretty rough training camps, mm -hmm. the Battle of the Bulge, going to Germany and finding that at least a dozen of your relatives are dead, more probably, and your grandmother's amongst them, the stuff toughens you up. Mm. And I think there's a toughness, uh, even a hardness to, to Kissinger that is, is hard for other people born in easier circumstances, born later in life, people who've never been at war. It's hard for them to grasp. The world can't have a crisis next week. I have no time in my schedule. Yeah, exactly. Uh, how should we address you, a journalist asks him after he's made Secretary of State. He says, I don't stand on ceremony. You can just call me Your Excellency. <laughs> and those sorts of jokes are, are, are almost Groucho Marx quality. Uh, but it's one of the things that, frankly, makes writing a book about him fun. This is not to trivialize, say, nuclear weapons and foreign policy, nor is it to trivialize what I'll have to talk about in, in volume two, but I think one has to, to understand the man, and that's really what a historian is trying to do. You're, you're not counsel for the defense or the prosecution uh, as an historian. Your, your task is to reconstruct a life, to reenact the thinking, and to try to get understanding so that the reader sees why this character behaves the way he does, why he accepts Nixon's offer of the job of national security advisor, despite having many reservations about Nixon the man. Understanding is what historians strive for. That is not the same as forgiving. That is not the same as excusing. Uh, and I think sometimes people don't understand that the historian's mission is rather different from the attorneys, from the lawyers. Uh, Eisenhower didn't want Nixon to hire him, right? S said he's a professor, he doesn't know anything, never had to make a decision. It's a great moment, isn't it, when Eisenhower, who's very sick, uh, hears that Nixon's offered a Harvard professor the job of national security advisor. He's indignant, uh, not unreasonably, since Harvard professors don't generally perform terribly well in any jobs other than Harvard professor. I speak with some experience in As a Harvard in professor. Street. As a Harvard professor. And so, so, so from Nixon's point of view, of course, there was something to be said for having an academic in the role. I think Nixon assumed he would be able to boss Kissinger around because he, Nixon, had far more political experience. Uh, he knew Kissinger was smart, he'd read his staff, uh, and he respected his intelligence. But there was a sense in which I think he hired Kissinger to be an instrument of presidential foreign policy. And I think one has to understand, particularly the first two or three years of the administration, with very much in mind that Nixon is the president and Kissinger's just the advisor. Hmm. At what point, I mean, it's pretty clear from, from the book that, that Henry Kissinger doesn't have an ear for or a lot of interest in domestic policy. Mm -hmm. But foreign policy, of course. At what point in his life did he discover that he wanted to be close to the decision makers 
and it was all about foreign policy? Good question. I think he went to Harvard uh, full of academic ambition. Uh, he did not write the kind of things you would write if you were planning a career in Washington. He, he writes a senior thesis called The Meaning of History, which is impenetrable. It's about the philosophy of Kant. And he then writes a history uh, dissertation about the Congress of Vienna, the decline of Napoleon and the re-establishment of European order in the 1820s. These are not the sorts of things you do if you have your sights uh, on the Situation Room. Uh, and I think it's gradually uh, in the course of discussions in Harvard Yard with his colleagues uh, that he gets interested in contemporary issues. And I think the ambition to be involved in policy really comes from conversations with uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., the historian, who was a little bit senior to him, uh, and an engagement with the, the contemporary issues of the Cold War, and then a job. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that contingency plays a big part in every life. He didn't get tenure at Harvard. He did not want to go to Chicago. So he got a job at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Uh, and the job was to act effectively as rapporteur on a panel working on nuclear strategy. Mm. Uh, and that ended up producing the book Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy that made him famous. If he hadn't got the job, I'm not sure he would ever have written the book. You quote somebody in the book, though, as describing him as being, quote, musically attuned to history and that it was essentially a God-given gift. You agree? I think there's a lot of truth in that. What you heard in the clip that you just played was a perfect illustration of the way his mind works. Kissinger has, has said, and I like this quote, that history is to states what character is to people, to individuals. Mm -hmm. And what you heard in his discussion of France today, Germany today, was a very uh, characteristic Kissingerian analysis of the different ways in which the French think of themselves and the Germans think of themselves. And that's, that's been his approach, I think, throughout his career. I, I would say, in some ways, this book is a book of applied history, showing ways in which a historical training can prepare you for understanding of the contemporary world. Kissinger, when he starts to think about the Soviet Union, thinks about it partly in historical terms. It is the Russian Empire under new management, but it's still, in many ways, Russia that you're dealing with. Mm. Uh, his preoccupation with Germany is, of course, rooted in a good knowledge, in fact, a deep knowledge of, of German history. The one country he always really struggled to understand was the United States. Mm. And I think this is a really important uh, point about him. Uh, even by 1968, he probably had only been to very few states of the Union, uh, and you know which ones, Massachusetts, New York, and then the list begins to get rather short, California, and uh, uh, On those occasions when Henry Kissinger encountered middle America, uh, I think there tended to be a something of a, a non-meeting of minds, and a struggle that he had, I think, throughout his career was in balancing his ambition to forge, to shape American strategy with the sheer difficulty of explaining that stuff uh, to ordinary Americans. Uh, later in his career, he embarked on a great lecture tour to try to sell detente to the American voters. It was not successful. Hmm. Uh, and in that sense, I think, there was a sort of tragic element built into his career. I think he even anticipates this in some of his early writings when he says the statesman cannot really communicate uh, what he's trying to do. Uh, there's a tragedy that lies ahead of you because if you're successful in averting disaster, uh, you're, you're not going to get any thanks for it. People aren't grateful for averted disasters. What did you say? That they don't write books about the history that didn't happen. Correct. And this is something that he's very alive to, that sense of things that didn't happen, that you avoided. Uh, in a democracy, there are very few payoffs for avoiding disaster. <laughs> it's much better to play for time, kick the can down the road, and hope that you get lucky. And sometimes you do, but not always. Let's finish up on this, because he's written, his latest book is called World Order, about about the new world, which is very much unlike the world he got to preside over, which was, you know, America as hegemon in some respects. Are, are we now at the end of the sort of preeminent America as, dictator's the wrong word, but you know what I'm trying to say, as, as one who can influence world affairs. In the U.S., they talk about leadership, uh, not dictatorship, right. Steve, and we don't Sorry. want to offend but, our U.S. But they viewers. also talk about leading from behind, and I know we don't mean that either. I, th I think that if, if, uh, if one reads 
Kissinger's book World Order, it's arguing that there are now at least four competing visions of world order mm -hmm. alongside the American one. There's a European one, which he was talking about in the clip that we played. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, a Chinese world order, and then there's an Islamic vision of order. And, and in, in the book, he argues that these are four views of the world that in some measure are in conflict with one another, and they're also in some measure unstable within themselves. Uh, I think we're going through a period of great self-doubt in the United States, doubt about American exceptionalism, doubt about the possibility of American leadership. I think President Obama has in many ways personified what a lot of Americans felt after the Iraq war. Uh, the pendulum has swung from intervention to non-intervention, as it has so often in American history. I don't think you can rule out the possibility that it could swing all the way back again under the right or, if you like, wrong circumstances. Mm. Uh, but I think Kissinger's right about one thing. We are in a deeply different world when there is an economy comparable in size to the United States. And we're in a deeply different world when Western values are challenged, not by Marxism, Leninism, but by extremist Islam. This is a different world from the world that he had to navigate in the 1970s. Did he like that better, the old world? I'm not so sure, because in some ways that old world so far, and it's early days to, to assess our time, but so far our time has been a lot less bloody than the time of the Cold War. And one must remember that there was far more armed conflict uh, in the 1970s than in, in recent times. Now, it may be that we're about to head back to a time of comparable conflict. And I sometimes look at the situation in the Middle East and I think, uh-oh, this could get as bad as the mid-Cold War. But right now, there is at least some order in the world. There isn't much armed conflict going on outside uh, the Muslim world. And that should give us some hope uh, that the world is going to be more peaceful in the 21st century than it was in the 20th. But one thing's for sure, it won't happen just by accident. And peace is not a spontaneous uh, thing that just pops up. That's something I've learned from studying the life of Henry Kissinger. It requires balances to achieve balance. And, and right now it's not at all clear that anybody is really prepared to be the world's balancer. Hmm. You would uh, do me the great favor of getting a move on volume two as quickly as possible. I'm doing my best. Good, okay. In the meantime, we do have volume one, Kissinger, 1923 to 68, The Idealist. Neil Ferguson, we always love your visits here at TVO. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.